Checking my email song. Checking my email song. Is that a strong bad reference? So, uh, this topic is, uh, I'm calling it quote unquote, socially responsible smartphone applications or smartphone apps. Um, and really this, this is kind of a weird one because really what set me off on this whole thing was just this random Facebook post that led to a Buzzfeed article. And I think I can hear the eyeballs rolling right now. Uh, for everyone listening to this, but uh, maybe bear with me for a little bit, because I'm just using this as, like, I don't know, a, a way to access common ideas and thoughts in, in our world. So th- the post was, let me let me get the title right here, 25 free apps that are making the world a better place. And I, I thought this was kind of interesting, so, I, you know, I, I was looking at it, And there's a lot of stuff in here where it's like you do a little thing and it ends up donating some money to a cause, which is a, you know, it's a good idea. It's a great thing, but I don't, maybe we'll go through and, and highlight a couple of these. So like the, the, it starts off with this application that, uh, if you take a picture of your food or a restaurant, it'll donate 25 cents. 25 cents to starving kids in South Africa or somewhere. And, um, what is it? Yeah, there's another one where it, you can, it'll track your running or walking and donate, what is it, 10 cents um, per mile or 25 cents per mile for every mile that you run to some cause. Um, and then also things, there's like another category here where it's like good products where you can, you know, scan the barcode or I don't know. Somehow the app tells you whether or not the product is like environmentally friendly or like there's one specifically for fish to find out if it was like rip, caught via sustainable like fishing practices. And I don't know, there's a, another one for, like, child labor, to you, so you could scan the barcode and find out if the the company participates in child labor or something like that. There's, like, all this stuff. And I'm not against any of it. I guess I need to say that in the beginning. I'm not against any of it, but this is my thought. And actually, this ties in... This is really interesting. Um, I'm glad that we had the talk earlier about wages for Facebook, because I think it kind of ties into that. It taps into that a little bit. Because, like, the donating a dollar for every picture of food that you take, my first reaction to that is actually, like, that's a lot of money. Like, I wouldn't have thought that it was worth that much, a whole dollar, for a picture of food. But, <laughs> maybe that that's a sidebar. But, the the... I guess what it's doing is it's taking, like, your regular internet activity, or in some places, just running. I'm not really sure how they monetize your running. But they take your regular internet activity and turn it into something that's socially good, which is sort of what we were talking about with the Wages for Facebook campaign, right? Like, take your posts on Facebook and the money that those raise via creating, like, an advertiser's profile of you and use that to provide internet access to, you know, across the globe or whatever in some way. This is kind of that same feel, but it's like, it's not just built... I guess my biggest problem... I'm going to cut to the chase. My biggest problem (laughs) with the whole thing from uh, a Marxist perspective is that, like... I feel like a lot of these things are things that are just how the world should work anyway. Like, I really shouldn't have to download an app for my internet activity to do good. Like, that's how we should structure society. We shouldn't, like, have this awful structure that leaves some people very poor and not meeting their, you know, that, you know, throws people in the gutter and then makes others extremely rich beyond our wildest dreams. 
and then try to make up for that with, like, extra tack-on programs. I feel like we should have a system that just kind of gets it right from the get-go, that do- doesn't allow for these awful things to happen. Yeah, I I agree with that. Although, I think, what it, when I hear these, like, especially with the, oh, you take a picture, we'll give a dollar thing, you, you hear ads on the radio or whatnot, every once in a while, they say, oh, you know, do this for a limited time and we'll donate, you know, a dollar for everything, up to a million dollars. My, I always go, why up to a million dollars? You're a giant corporation. Give them a million dollars. Why set a limit? Maybe that will make people buy a bajillion things. Who cares if you give twenty million dollars to charity? It's it, and I, I'm not saying specifically with these apps, although maybe for a couple of them, uh, it's it's really more in in those cases where instead of actually trying to do much good, they are just trying to show that they do good uh, yep. without necessarily affecting much yeah, exactly. by setting the cap. Yeah, because there's, like, a market to be made for being good. Like, pe- that's something that we've reached a point in society where people really want to do the right thing. Um, and now there's a market for it. People are willing to pay or to do something, or, you know, to pay either money or time or whatever to do, to feel good. Yeah. And and feel like the the action that they took was the socially responsible action, which is a wonderful thing. That's great that people want to do that. But it means that in a capitalist system, what the incentive is, is to make your product look like that. But there's there's a fundamental contradiction because the amount of money that you use to do good is an amount of money that you no longer have power over yourself, that you can't reinvest into expanding your own wealth. And so the the temptation, of course, is to make it look like you're doing a lot of good, which will tap into that market, but then not necessarily do as much good as you could, because you want to expand, you want to advertise your application more, you want to, I don't know, use it as seed material for other projects that you have, whatever. Like, you, there's, there's a certain contradiction there, um, between, uh, the, the market that is out there for socially responsible things and then the reality of it. Yeah, and I think, uh, Slava Zizak uh, has uh, a very nice thing about this. Um, I believe it was in a book. I saw it in a talk that on YouTube where he's talking about the internalization of the act of charity within the act of consumption that necessitates the act of charity in the first place. It's and I know specifically he talks about Starbucks and Tom's shoes. It's you no longer have to feel bad for your act of consumption, which is the problem because, oh, look, the charity is done there. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go out and do the charity because you're just doing it in your everyday normal self. And that's what these apps really make me think of because, especially at the running one, oh, I go running perfect now. My running, not that running is. There isn't really much of a problem with running, so maybe that's a bad example of one to pull from there. But, well, but like the, yeah. the going out and eating out, okay, you know, we're paying this more money for this stuff, and, you know, who knows the ecological impact of how the food was created and whatnot, but, mm-hmm. oh, money's being donated, so it's okay. Yeah, no, it, I I think it totally aligns with that. And if and if our listeners want to check it out, I think it's pretty easy to find it. You're thinking of the RSA animate yeah. version of, of I think is actually like a snippet of a talk that he gave or yeah, something like I, that. Yeah, I watched, I didn't watch all of it this morning, I didn't have time of the actual talk, but it's first as tragedy, then as farce, I believe. Uh, yeah, I, which, I, I think I think it's a book that he put out under that title, and then probably gave some talks under that title as well. Yeah. But, yeah, if, if so if viewers want to look up what we're talking about, RSA animate is like the, the channel... And, um, it's, it's the one with Slavoj Zizek talking first as tragedy, then as farce. Yep. Yeah. We'll have to but, put up links. I think we'll oh, yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. We'll put a link up on the WordPress. Um, 
But yeah, it totally taps into that whole idea. And I, I think even, even like when it comes to running, like the app where it's given 25 cents per every mile that you run, in a certain sense, running is, it's good for you. Right. And it's not necessarily bad for, for anyone else in the rest of the world. Um, maybe it's lowering like our, our healthcare costs or something. So that might be good societally, but it, to a certain degree, it's also just like you doing something for your own health. You know, you're not necessarily, it doesn't alleviate this sense of I need to do something good in the world. It's, uh, largely something that you do, I think, for yourself. And at least I do. I, I jog from time to time, and I I don't think of my jogging as any sort of charity work or anything like that. But if I felt the need to do charity, I could think that I'm killing two birds with one stone if I just got this app. Like running for charity events or... Yeah, because otherwise we're just going out for a run is essentially a selfish act, not in like in the bad sense of selfish. Uh-huh. Um, I guess unless you're running because, you know, I don't want to die of a heart attack because I have a kid or, you know. Oh, yeah. In yeah. my case. The, the, this is actually kind of interesting because I think we've opened the door in the conversation now to doing things that you would do anyway, but now doing them for charity. And you know what's, I don't know very much about this world. And based on the internet savviness of most podcast listeners, I'm going to guess that our listeners probably know a lot about this. And maybe you do too. I'm not sure. Um, but one of my friends is really into competitive video game playing, like tr- like speed runs and like other things where you do something like ridiculously hard to do in a video game. Uh, And he will, like, watch streamed events and things like that. And a lot of them are done for charity. A lot of them, like, there's a fee to watch or a fee to participate or whatever. And people, and like, they raise a bunch of money for charity based on competitive video gaming. And I think that fits into... uh, It all. It felt weird for me the first time I learned that they were doing it for charity. But, like, I feel like that is... Uh, uh, it's a legitimate, it's a legitimization mechanism. Yeah. Uh, to take something that s- may seem pointless or even destructive in the face of like, just like blatant consumerism, like going in and getting your Starbucks coffee in the morning. That's because like, you, you know, you're just spending like 350 on a cup of coffee that you didn't need to spend. Oh God! It's more than three fifty. <laughs> is it? I don't even know how much. I is, is, is. I did not get a Starbucks coffee this morning, but the coffee I bought this morning from a a local uh, place because I slightly preference a you know local business over a chain uh-huh. was I think four fifty. Four fifty. Four fifty. Yeah, that See, is. I think that's why Starbucks is featured heavily in Slavoj's talk because. I think they are, it feels particularly kind of like bad or irresponsible to do that. Yeah. And not that I'm above going to Starbucks. I will go to Starbucks. (laughs) I don't want to make it sound like I'm all holier than thou. I will, I will buy Starbucks coffee without a second (laughs) thought. (laughs) I, uh, but yeah, I, I feel like that's especially why they need to do it is because it feels a lot like just a blind consumerist act of, of the worst variety of, of the kind where you, you know that this is a quite a, like a decent chunk of money for a thing that you don't necessarily need to have. Yeah. I mean, cause you can, for two cups of coffee, you can go buy a, you know, several weeks worth of beans and. Yeah. Right. And even like if you get, you know, um, expensive coffee, you, it still oh, yeah. pales like, in like, comparison. Like making fair trade coffee at home has got to still be like way cheaper than buying Starbucks or, or any coffee shop coffee. Yeah. It's, I, and I, I'm trying to think of why I do it. Half the time we get coffee for convenience. Go out. And this is when we can afford it, because we obviously cannot afford to pay that every... Yeah. This is a, you know, once or twice a week at most thing. Uh-huh. It's a nice special little treat. Maybe that's it. It's like a treat. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, because, yeah, it's the same thing with other things that are treats. Like, like going out and getting ice cream and and having your ice cream cone or whatever, right? Like, oh, yeah. buying a gallon of ice cream is probably the, the... A gallon of ice cream, especially if you get the cheap stuff, is probably the same as, like, one ice cream cone. Yeah, and I just made homemade frozen custard the other day. Chocolate mm-hmm. frozen custard. And it probably cost me... Four dollars at most to make two quarts of ice cream. Yeah. Which is, you know, what, probably a scoop or two at Baskin Robbins for <laughs> more ice cream than I'm gonna eat in a month. Uh huh. So yeah, it's yeah, it's a weird it's a weird thing going out and getting that. But I wonder if I'd be more apt to get the Baskin or oh no, I don't I don't even know where there's a Baskin Robbins. That's just the only chain I could think of. <laughs> But, you know, I wonder if I'd be more apt to get it if it felt like I was doing something good. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's definitely, I'm not sure either. It's definitely one of those things that I feel like I am, I will freely admit, I will buy something that I feel socially responsible over something that is not. Mm-hmm. Like, I refuse to shop at Walmart. Uh-huh. But it's not that the places I'm shopping at are necessarily any better than Walmart. They're just yeah. not as stained socially. Like, I'll shop a lot at Target, which yeah. isn't better than Walmart. Maybe a little bit, but... Yeah. I mean... Right? Yeah, we're really talking about, deg- like, a, a difference in degree that probably isn't really that big of a difference, especially compared to the standard that we'd be looking for, right? Yeah. Like... Compared to a a cooperatively owned and operated business that is, you know, responsive to the community and blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, it does all the things that we would list out as an ideal, like, institution. Both Walmart and Walmart and Target are far closer to each other than either one is to what we're really looking for. But I do the exact same thing where I, I won't buy from... Uh, Walmart, but it's like, well, I need a, a place to get all that stuff, and so then, like, I end up going to Target or wherever. Yeah, and I think for a retail thing like that, like, I don't know... I think part of the problem with a lot of that stuff is it's hard to find a socially something that I'm okay shopping at. Like, they're hard to find, and even here where we have, I think, the highest percentage of cooperatives per capita in the United States, I believe. Really? If not, if we might have the most per capita. I don't remember. We have a very high percentage, hmm. though, compared to other places. And even still, like, yeah. I feel very good when I go to the cooperative grocery store yeah. and buy the cooperative coffee that's, you know... As a worker co-op, you know, the coffee's worker cooperative roasters, and they are all free trade and work with other cooperatives around the world that do coffee. It's just coffee. I should mention their name because they are, make really good coffee and oh, good. they do that stuff. Um, and I, I think, I see, and then I wonder if there's how much of a distinction there is between getting something like from just coffee, which I love their coffee. Um, and getting like I had bought some mate tea, and on the the tea it said, by consuming you know one cup of tea of this, you have reduced pollution by this much, and you have saved this much amount of money in the developing. And it, like it listed, it literally listed out the this is the measurable amount of charity you do every time you drink one of these. Uh I mean, to really, you know, for really internalizing that, and that's just mind but I was, I could not believe that, like, I don't know how good I felt about buying it then after I saw that. Because it was, like, like freakish or, or like, it felt unbelievable or, like, what, what, what was going on? It was just so weird to see that, and I think I, this was a day after I had first seen that uh, that talk by uh, Zizek. Um, so, I mean, that was particularly in there. Because then I was like, maybe this wasn't the best thing to buy, because am I 
am I really buying something good or am I, you know, am I, am I just buying into that I'm buying something good? Well, and I, I think that there's an important distinction here too, where it's the, to me, the, the idea that some small amount of charity is integrated into a consumerist act is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but it's that we have to realize that that's not the limit of good that can be done. That there, that what we're doing here is an alleviation for a problem that still exists. Um, and so I think the danger comes in when you feel, oh, I've, I don't really need to worry about social problems because I, I bought my coffee at Starbucks and they donated some money to the third world and I took a picture of it. So this app donated some money. And then when I walked back, I got it another 25 cents for this other thing. Like right. that's, that's not the way that social problems will be solved is by like micro donations for all these things. Plus, like why do the, the, you have to like, this is the other thing that annoys me about this is like, this requires you to go out and actively download the app. Like, you really need to do, like, a large amount of opting in for this stuff to work this way. Yeah. Which I think is, is, is a benefit that, like, the, the Starbucks and Tom Shoes models have where, like, you don't necessarily need to do anything different. It's, like, just the way the business is set up to work. Um, but, yeah, the limit is still there. Yeah. I, and there's another component with charity that I think is good to bring up. And actually, I got into an argument with, I think it was my mother about this the other day, about Bill Gates. Um, cause I believe I was talking about inheritance tax and how someone like Bill Gates should not be allowed to give billions of dollars to someone that that needs to go into the government coffers so we can do social programs and the response i got back was something like well he donates like half of his money to charity and i said okay good that's good the charity's good however how much of the things that he's donating to is he causing you know the the you know okay good he's giving money to poor people how many people did Microsoft put out of jobs when all of a sudden, bam, computers were cheap and easy because Microsoft helped revolutionize PCs? Not that that's all on his feet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, technology and capitalism oh, yeah. is something I, I think you've covered before, so we don't need to get into <laughs> it. But I, um, but like, you know, he's one causing part of the problems, and two, he clearly it doesn't the things he do does is not worth billions of... He has never done work in his life that is worth uh, probably a million dollars, let alone a billion dollars. I just... I literally do not think anybody can create that amount of value just through... The, not individually. Uh, yeah. A billion dollars is a lot. Yeah. Like, his yeah. corporation, I'm sure, has, but, you know, he mm -hmm. himself is not. But it's he decides what he the charity goes for. Oh yeah. It's not that he's appropriated this, you know, the money which is a socially produced product. It's he then non socially gets to direct it. And he where does he direct it? He directs it to things like online learning things and other charter type schools that are really destroying public education. He, and not that I think he's doing it out of maliciousness or trying to destroy public education. Yeah. But he thinks he knows better because he's rich and in our society, a rich person is always right. Uh, you know, yeah. their opinion is worth more. Look at when they ask, you know, I don't know. Kim Kardashian or somebody else who's famous these days, ask them a question about a social... Why? She's not qualified to answer anything other than maybe, I don't know, how does her TV show work? Or, you know, uh -huh. I mean, it's... I This this actually is... I love that you brought this up. I was um, in a car once uh, for work, and I was with, like, not 
the person I reported to or the person that person reported to, but, like, one level up from that. Oh, your boss is boss's boss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sort of. Like, it wasn't, like, a direct chain, but it was it was someone who was relatively high up there. Um, well, part of it was because I was, like, the lowest rung at this point. But I, either way, it doesn't really matter. I And um, we were talking about education, and I... Uh, had formerly worked as a teacher and studied education and like I had a pretty good background in education but this guy had no problem telling me exactly what was wrong with education and what he would do and basically he believed he essentially bought into the Bill Gates thing he was like you know he he thought that the Bill Gates way was the way to go and I think it was totally like one him buying into Bill Gates is rich and clearly has made a lot of good business decisions and so therefore he deserves to you know we should you know observe his opinion for other things that you know he may not know anything about but he's rich so guess what his opinion is the best opinion and like you know he he didn't feel like there wasn't really very much bashfulness like oh you've studied education for a long time and worked in the industry so you probably know better than me that like wasn't a thought that crossed this guy's mind it was, you know, he he felt like he um, had had the right ideas for where it needed to go, which was very interesting to me. Yeah, he could mentally compare bank accounts and know that he clearly understood it better than you did. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, which, yeah, totally. Uh, and not to say that uh, you know I know everything about where education should go, but I feel like I probably had a leg up on him. I mean, maybe, maybe he did a whole bunch of research that I don't know anything about, but I kind of doubt it. No, I, uh, <laughs> I, I hang out with a lot of educators, and yeah, no, he is, yeah, that is not, that is not the way to go. <laughs> I think it's pretty easy to show that too, yeah. but you know, that's, that's not what people want to hear. Um, they just, and yeah, it's such weird thing in our country, and I think it comes from this, uh, nonsensical pull yourself up by your bootstraps thing that they really, really, really want everybody to believe is a thing in this country. That, you know, they're self-made man. And for some reason, that person, even though largely this stuff is not, like, really necessarily them, like, Henry Ford is a, not a favorite example of people, mm -hmm. except Henry Ford's first car company went completely bankrupt. He was only successful because there's a rich person backing him who supplied all this money. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, he didn't pull himself up from his boot. But it's that sort yeah, of... It makes a bad story, though. You don't want to read a story that's he got bailed out by some guy or whatever. Like, Yeah, but I mean, it's. I think it's... It makes a bad story, but I think it makes a good socially responsible story because... Oh, yeah. It makes great ideology. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, it... Yeah, it's just the... It's why it's sort of, I wonder, I'd like to see the editing room floor for when they do, like, the talking to the random person on the street stuff. Because mm. it seems like most of the time, they must, I, they, I swear they must edit to, you know, have, like, the stupidest person. <laughs> or pick somebody that you stereotypically would not expect to have a knowledgeable answer. Mm -hmm. Like, pick somebody who maybe looks homeless, and then when you ask them a question about, blah, blah, you know, oh, why is politics bad? And he has a very well-reasoned thing. Everybody's like, ha ha, that's funny, that homeless guy knew something. You know, like, I, I, I think that that sort of thing is something where they should really go out and talk to more normal people cuz i bet i bet you'd get just the same answers as you would of these you know rich self-made people it's, but they have money therefore not only did people the general public listen but thanks to the supreme court citizens united their money talks now louder in washington than it ever has <laughs> yeah. and that's even scarier is that these people who don't know anything about stuff get to decide not only through their charity where money is going, but just through the fact that they have money, they get to, yeah, they get to decide where all the politics are going and all the other social money that's not supposed to be decided by them. Yeah. It's supposed to be democratically decided. I, I love that we started with the example of, of Bill Gates too, especially with, with Microsoft and all that, 
because like like our theme earlier where certain things have sort of become public goods, like we were talking about the internet kind of becoming a public good, in many ways Google is like that because so many people use it. Like once we've kind of all agreed that this is the way we're going to do something like, like for example, Microsoft Word, it's actually really inconvenient to have other platforms to do this like because if you need to transfer it to another computer you need to submit it somewhere for someone to edit or grade or whatever like it's actually really inconvenient to have formats that aren't compatible so it's really nice if it all is the same thing uh and if it's privately held that just means tons of money across the world is all flowing into the coffers of of a privately held group where it's sort of you know a a collective social thing where we've decided okay this is the the software program that we're going to use for word processing or whatever um and it you know not to say that they shouldn't get any compensation for that i'm sure there are like lots of programmers that worked on it and you know support people and whatever and then they should all be paid fairly. But at a certain point, it, that's all been paid off. And now there's just, like, this extra, you know, fee that we pay to Microsoft that Bill Gates collects and then decides what to do with. And then we're all so happy when he decides to do something good with it or something that he perceives to be good. Um, because he's not spending it as selfishly as he could. But the truth of the matter is that all that money came from people, you know, the the world's decision that Word will be the way that we do word processing. And, and the, you know, all of the work of all of the people at Microsoft that went into that, not really just Bill Gates. Yeah, and Microsoft is all, you know, talking of monopolies even... They don't explicitly have a monopoly, but they implicitly have a monopoly. I mean, Macs are very popular these days, but I still think they're less than 10% of the market share. D- don't people still run Microsoft Word on Macs, yeah, too? people still run Microsoft so, Word on... Yeah, so even if you're not using Windows OS, like yeah. as an operating system or whatever, you... Still running Word. You're still... So influenced by the world of Microsoft. There's oh, probably yeah. many ways in which you just cannot get away from it. Oh, yeah. And if you look at governments, most national governments and state governments sign contracts with Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And then what Microsoft does is they keep pumping out new operating systems and new versions of Word. And because governments like standards, because why not... They all go to the new one pretty quickly, like, um, I know at my work we've been switching out all of the computers that had Windows XP on them. Windows XP worked fine. Wasn't a big deal. We didn't need new computers. We have very minimal requirements. So we had to buy all brand new computers with Windows 8 on them because they were no longer going to provide technical support. For Windows XP. Oh. And I bet anybody who works in IT is painfully aware of this anywhere in the country in any pub- public or private enterprise, because I'm sure this is exactly what they've been doing, is upgrading everything because once Microsoft doesn't support it, even though I'm not actually sure the real value of the support that Microsoft mm. gives yeah. for that stuff... Uh, everybody just upgrades and oh, yeah. they all buy new operating systems, new versions of uh, Word and Excel mm-hmm. and I it's just and Microsoft arbitrarily gets to decide when to impose essentially this tax on everyone. Yeah. It's that's I mean that's really what it is. It's a tax. It's a yeah. you randomly all de- well not quite randomly. You all decided to go with this even though there are things like Linux that are free that they are perfectly adaptable for any situations. There are things like LibreOffice or OpenOffice, which are phenomenal, work exactly like Microsoft Word, 
and are completely free and open source, and you can look at it and see what they're doing. Yep. And it's made by volunteers, and it's wonderful, and just as every bit good as any other product. And no one is using the free product. Like, that's that's a really odd feature of a capitalist kind, that there is something equivalently good that costs nothing. Mm-hmm. But instead, we collectively, vast majority of us, collectively choose to pay for something we could have for free. And I'm guessing the perception is, oh, well, the free stuff isn't as good as that, or, oh, well, uh, you know. Well, there's the issue of compatibility, too. It's a lot like we were talking about, like, social networks and uh earlier where the value of a social network if you're the only person on it is basically nil same thing i think probably very similar things apply to word processing or anything where you want to be compatible with another group the the i can say for both LibreOffice and open office you can use they are compatible with word yeah yeah but the newest version of word well, I remember when DocX came out. Do you remember when DocX came out? And then yeah, like, there was a little hiccup there with the yep. free ones, but it caught up. It's fine now. I yeah, yeah but it's like they're intentionally making it that oh, way yeah. so that oh, yeah. it won't. Um, and yeah, the, so there's like an arms race, I think, for like compatibility because Microsoft doesn't want them to be compatible because yeah. it has the market share. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even. Even with them being a hundred percent compatible, it's just so hard for anyone else to get their foot in the door. Mm-hmm. I mean, Microsoft doesn't even have to try and enforce a monopoly because investments in technology are so expensive. So even if you went, okay, Linux is free. I mean, there are versions you can pay for, but let's. Let's all go with a free operating system and free word processor. Well, they're not 100% the same. So then you need to pay for training for all that, and then there are people get frustrated, and then everybody just goes. People tend to, when things change and they get frustrated, they have the very conservative reactionary, well, let's just go back to what we had before. It worked perfectly fine then. Let's not question it. Um, and I, I think that, that, I think that's really what keeps Microsoft in a monopoly these days. Mm -hmm. Even though Mac has made headway, and I think in many ways, business-wise, Macs are uh, more, Apple is more ruthless than Mm -hmm. Microsoft. Because not only, not are they, no, they're not, uh, their operating systems aren't cheap to get the new one. But if you have an iPhone, I mean, I don't even know what they're on for iPhones now. Are they on 5? I, I mean... At least 5. I don't it's, know. You know, it's... Oh, a new phone. Oh, an S. S. <laughs> it has Siri. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's... They, they do it very much with that stuff, so... And the hardware for them... I mean, they can sell the software so cheap because the hardware is so expensive. And... Because it's trendy, people assume it's better. Uh-huh. And I think part of the reason why people can say, oh, well, Macs are more reliable and whatnot, is because unlike a PC, you know, with a PC you have a million different options. You know, you can get a Dell, a Hewitt Packard, a, you know, this and that, and, or you can make your own, and, you know, oh, you want an Intel or an ARM, and a, it, there's so much difference, whereas with a Mac, it's, this is the MacBook. This, there's this version of MacBook, and here's our newer version. And so the experience is pretty, um, homogenized. Yeah, standardized. Mm -hmm. So, instead of people being like, oh, I had this issue and this issue, it's, there's just one issue and then they can fix it. And then, I think it creates an artificial sense of superiority with those products. Well, I think, I think. Or maybe that's just a smart business plan. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'm not sure that it's entirely artificial. Like, I think there's probably a market for that. And there, you know, I, I know that I, I have friends that are, and, and you might fall into this category too, that are really into like computer customization 
and that feel frustrated and violated by a Mac not letting you do all that kind of stuff, not giving you the control. Yes, that's exactly why I'm not a fan of Macs. Yeah, but I think for a lot of people, that really doesn't make a difference. And probably even for me, it wouldn't make a difference. Like, I can appreciate it theoretically, but in practice, am I going to do any computer customization that I couldn't do on a Mac? Probably not. Probably not. I probably would never notice if, like, someone didn't tell me that there was a difference. I mean, I don't even do a ton of computer customization. I just like, yeah, I guess I like the option. I do do some stuff, though. It, I'm trying to think. It really depends. It depends on my mood. <laughs> <laughs> there's one, there's another app that I had seen on here. Um, which, there were two like this, but this one seemed somewhat more egregious, and I, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, like, I couldn't decide if this was something, they're trying to, so it's, I should just, it's put out by the UN, it's called My Life as a Refugee. Oh, yeah. And the idea is to spread awareness about uh, refugees and having issues worldwide, which is a noble goal because the amount of worldwide refugees is staggering, especially if you're looking out of Syria and Iraq these days. It is frightening, the amount of people and how little aid they have. But somehow making it to be a game that you can just download out of the App Store seems to me, instead of to highlight the plight, seems more like you're trivializing it by you you gamifying it almost. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, no, I agree. Like, I don't know if the point of the game is just to be like, oh, no food again today, or like, yay, no longer refugee, like, I, I don't know, it just seems like a noble aim, but probably a terrible execution well and i think there's yeah this problem with any time you try to have like a let's see what it's like to be a disadvantaged person kind of scenario like there you the this was a thing that happened while i was at college and i think places still do this where it's like spend a night as being homeless or whatever so that you can like learn about homelessness well it's very different to like sleep under the stars in a sleeping bag or whatever knowing that you can go back to your dorm room at any moment then and to be like legitimately homeless and i feel like it like you said it's a noble aim to try to get there but i think it's questionable whether or not like, are you really teaching what it's like to be there? I don't know. Maybe, like, maybe if I played this game, I would learn a lot about refugees. I actually, I mean, if I'm going to be completely honest with myself, there is so much I don't know about refugees. It would be amazing if I didn't learn something. Like, I would have, like, I don't know where where most refugees are from or where they're going or how they live on a daily life. Like, I don't know the vast majority of those things. Uh, But after playing this game, should I say, oh yeah, I know what it was like to be a refugee, and it was hard, or it was not that hard, or whatever. Like, I'm not sure I'm prepared to pass judgment after a a simulation, whether it's an iPhone game, or, or just, you know, like... A, a, a real life scenario kind of thing. Either way, yeah, it's yeah, it's one of those things where it really does straddle the line between just being like I imagine if a homeless guy saw a bunch of college students sleeping outside, they're like, oh, we're seeing what your life is like. They would not have a positive reaction to that. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, because, I mean, for one, there's no social stigma attached to it, mm-hmm. which is huge. Um, two, you 
probably aren't super hungry going to bed when you're a college student going there. Uh, no. It, it, it's, you know, it's... Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's not like you can, it's not like you can be like, hey, you know, to get people where it's not like you can be like, oh, guess what, your tuition fee didn't go through, so get out of here. And then, you know, coordinate with the parents, be like, no, what are you doing? Go back to college. I don't care. Get out of, you know, where they actually, like, force you to feel like you're homeless, because that would be ethically awful <laughs> i mean but short of that like i don't really know how much how you could do that yeah and yeah so it is a touchy thing and i'm not sure exactly you know the best way to i think actually honestly this gets to i think a larger issue that happens with any with any movement or action that wants to um, mobilize people that aren't particularly in that situation, right? Like, if the civil rights movement wants to have, um, you know, alliance with, with white folks, or if a feminist movement wants to have, you know, male allies or whatever, you're always in this situation where you've got people who don't necessarily, that don't have personal experience with that, um, Participating? I don't know. I, I'm not sure if there's a better word than that. There might. I'm not even sure if participating is the right word, but I, I, it makes yeah. it tricky for sure. Not to say that it shouldn't happen. I think all you know, the having allies is a great thing, but I think it is one of the trickier things to make it all work out smoothly. Yeah. Sorry. I I've now downloaded this game and. That's going kind of slow. Although it was kind of... It seems to be like a point-and-click adventure. And this might get really dark. Sorry. <laughs> I was... I was surprised, though. The first thing that it was was... Oh, Jesus. I was just executed in about five clicks. That's kind of dark. That's a really dark game, because I picked to be a 15-year-old little kid, and it was like, rebels attack, and your brothers, you know, can't fight or something. Like, you stay with him, or do you try and flee? You have 30 seconds to decide. Mm, yeah. What did you do? I ran away. <laughs> you ran away? And I ran away. You. What happened? Uh, well, well, then, shot? What, what, then you I on? ran into the rebels... And then I tried to bribe them to let me go. And then they killed me. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm not exactly sure if that's being a refugee or on the road to becoming a refugee. And I don't know how much awareness that raises. I'll have to play with it more later. But that is dark. That is very dark. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's... I mean, maybe there's some use to that. In the yeah. sense that, like... It may when, not when be I that When I hear, painful. like, oh, there's a bunch of refugees, maybe I will have more sympathy towards that. Like, if, like, say there's a bunch of refugees that, like, can't currently get health care, and, like, there's this big to-do, like, I don't know, in, in my local area about whether or not refugees have the rights to do X, Y, and Z, maybe I'll have a little bit more sympathy if I understand that they may have had to abandon their family and, like, do, I don't know, whatever it took to get out of the si awful situation they were in. Yeah, so maybe that isn't a patronizing game. Then Maybe it actually just looks like it could be patronizing. It might actually do a little a bit of what it's supposed to, which is good. But I, I think, though, the idea of raising awareness, like, I hear this a lot for, like, breast cancer stuff. It's, you know... um, the, the the pink ribbon thing basically becoming an industry upon itself. Mm. It's like you know the how much it's how much effort and money and time should be devoted to awareness, which is important, especially in the beginning of any struggle for anything. Yep. And how much is devoted to actually solving the problems. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I I mean that's uh, probably a topic by topic issue. But like with the, yep. the the breast cancer thing, 
I think it's probably at a point where awareness could get doesn't need to be spread as much because there already is a high degree of awareness of it. Do you remember the numbers from that? Because I remember hearing, like, it was some small, like, 15% or something of, like, all that pink ribbon stuff is what actually went to cancer research, and the rest of the 85 cents largely goes to, like, the administration of the nonprofit and, like, quote unquote raising aware awareness, which is like just hosting more events and selling more pink ribbons. And it's like, hmm, yeah, it does seem like there's this sort of like we raise awareness so we can sell more pink ribbons to raise awareness. Yeah. It be- where where it becomes like a caricature. Yeah. It becomes its own industry, its own thing. And you know, and I I too have heard those numbers and I could not say where they're coming from, though, which is bothers me because I <laughs> I'd like to know who's pulling those numbers. Although I can't imagine there's a group some, that's some pro, pro. There's not a some pro, pro breast cancer group. <laughs> yeah, I mean I think the closest you can come to pro cancer is maybe tobacco companies, but they don't have a hand in the breast cancer that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> they probably do, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, and that's one of those other things that, with, particularly with the cancer, that I don't know if you could find someone who would be like, why should we cure cancer? Like, I think it's one of those, it's an issue that, I don't know, it, there's not really two sides about it, you know? There aren't people who... Mm -hmm. There is not a pro-cancer group. Mm -hmm. Um, Or at least none that I am aware of. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, I guess you create awareness, but then... Yeah, I mean, maybe they need to shift awareness to how to solve the problem better and why is it not easy to solve the problem which i think is yeah. something that people are very confused about is yeah is why isn't cancer solved no i think i agree with you cuz you can find analogies where there's like like for example homelessness probably you can can't find anyone that's pro homelessness right but you can find a wide range of opinions as to what the right thing to do about homelessness is. Yeah. Or the reason that people are homeless. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, uh, the approach of a lot of places is just to start outlawing essentially being homeless. Yeah. To to say it's illegal to sleep on a park bench or whatever. It's illegal to, like, do all these things. And all of those things are basically things that you only do if you are homeless. Yeah. So it's like basically just saying, if you're homeless, we're going to put you in jail now. Uh, which doesn't, I mean, I guess if they're in jail, they're not homeless anymore, but it doesn't really sound like a solution to me. No. And I recently saw a, st- saw a statistic that said, I believe it said it was four times more expensive to jail a homeless person than it was to just, like give them enough money so that they wouldn't be homeless. Oh, yeah, to, like, <laughs> just give them an apartment with, like, a a food stipend or something. Yeah, it was something like, I don't remember, like, $15,000 a year versus, like, $60,000 a year or something. Oh, I don't yeah. know the exact numbers off the top of my head. Yeah, I believe it. Because, you know, for jails, you got to pay for the bars and the food and the health and the... Yeah. I mean, there are homeless people and who will get themselves arrested so that they can get food or health care or something like that, which is really sad that we're at a state where yeah, that being incarcerated is preferable to, yep. to being on the outs of capitalism. Yeah, that's just a major, like head-shaking moment where you're like, what is wrong? Yeah, and nobody wants to deal with homelessness. I don't know why it's something that people have so much issue, probably because of the the stigma attached with mental illness, mm-hmm. which I don't... I'm, I know I've seen statistics, and it is... They, 
the vast, vast majority of homeless people, the problem with them is that they are homeless. <laughs> you know, it's not that some of them have jobs, you know, a lot of them have families. It's not that they're crazy, it's that they don't have a home to live in. Mm-hmm. And I, working at a library, I mean, there are people in every day who, I mean, that's where they go. They're, mm-hmm. They don't have a place to go. They come to the library every day. Mm-hmm. But it's not like anything really gets done for them. It's Yeah. Well, and I'm sure, I think this is probably part of the problem with, like, trying to organize to solve a homelessness issue is there uh, probably this the like a lot of people if you live in a city and that that has homeless people in it you've probably had at least one negative experience with a homeless person at some point in your life at least one if yeah. like um my mom actually works downtown and so she has to ignore homeless people who are asking for money every day at lunch when she like walks to where she goes for lunch and then walks back to the office there happens to be homeless people there and you know that's uh you know not that she believes that it's their fault in any way shape or form but it's you know a an an annoyance to a certain degree right um so i think that that adds a level of complexity to the issue that a lot of people feel negatively about homeless people because of that. Yeah. And, uh, and then also at the same time, yeah, like the perception that, uh, oh, they're all drug addicts, so we can't do anything anyway because there's no hope for those people. You know, that's an attitude. Or that even, even worse, the worst, problem the perception that you're only ever homeless if you did something wrong and it, you could just stop being homeless at any point in time like like why don't you get a job it's like uh okay if you don't have an address to put on uh, a, a job application they just i don't throw think it you're away. gonna get a job yeah. yeah like how are you gonna get a job if you don't have an address like that's that's the best response is when people are like well why don't they just get a job and it's like ooh. You you really haven't thought this one through, have you? Yeah. There's there's like some major challenges. I don't know how this person is supposed to do what you want them to do. Yeah, it's hard enough for people with degrees to get jobs. You know, how <laughs> is a homeless person supposed to yeah, right? compete with, you know, somebody who's working on their PhD for <laughs> a part-time job? You know, it's... Right. I, I like... It was Louis C.K. as a, a stand, a part of a stand-up routine, where he's talking about somebody coming visiting him, um, who didn't live in New York, and walking past a homeless person. They're like, "Oh my God, sir, are you okay?" They're like, "What are you doing? Come on, just ignore him. Walk past." They're like, "Oh, but doesn't he need my help?" And they go, "Oh yeah, totally. He really needs your help. But come on, let's go. You you don't you just ignore the homeless people, <laughs> you know." And New York is obviously much, much worse than here. Yeah. Although at least I can say positively for Madison, there's the tiny homes that they uh, occupy Madison has been working on. Yeah. And I believe they've made a little bit of headway with the city in getting... I know they've built one, I believe, so far. Uh Uh-uh. And I believe they've made some headway with the council and actually been able to put them places. Um, I don't know the exact status of that moment, so I mean that is one one positive thing that a group's doing at least about that. Yeah, because that helps having a place to live. Yeah, <laughs> it helps immensely. We, we should. Mm, it might not be a good idea for us to like revisit that topic, read up on it, and talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, as as a future topic on here, because there's. We could probably go on about that for a while, but I don't know very much about it. No, I don't know a ton about it either. All I know is that it's out of the Occupy Madison. Yeah. And that I've seen it get national press, so. Cool. They're doing something. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think let's call that the end of this topic. Okay. And we'll have to pick topics for next time now. Yeah. Topics.
This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.